Happy Monday, YouTube. It's your boy, Lion Guy Sai. Um, so as it is Monday, we are doing another chapter in the Fundamentals of Go by uh, Kageyama. Today's chapter will be over life and death. Um, and so it will include quite a few diagrams, but uh, hopefully y'all can pause the video as you see fit and try to solve them. Uh, but other than that, we're just going to go at it as always. And yeah. Chapter 6 life and death. Japan, the loser in the Second World War, has passed the succeeding 20-some years in peace, but the Cold War between the two powers that seem to control the world, the Soviet Union and the United States, still continues, while the rise of a third power threatens to complicate the world situation to such a point that we cannot hope to understand it. Everyone realizes that if there is a real Third World War, using the atomic and hydrogen bombs that in this scientific age both sides have prepared, the world may end in a flash and a boom. No one would start a war like that, not, at least, if he had any sense. But human beings sometimes get carried away. They get carried away and cut, for example, with no regard to who is helped and who is hurt, who gains and who loses. This is to be feared. Let a war start, and a small country like Japan will surely be destroyed. When I worry about this, I lose the urge to do anything. Everything becomes meaningless. At least this is not a private fear. Everyone on earth shares it, so ordinarily I dismiss it from my mind. Anyone who leads an abandoned and dissipated life because the end of the world is near is going to be experiencing his own personal dis destruction first. Desperation and despair are to be feared, most of all. To kill or to let live? I would like to see this disturbing question confirm, confined to the stones on the go board. Diagram 1. Problem. Black to play and kill. A Don ranked player should have the answer the moment he sees the diagram. Anyone who cannot solve it at all has a doubtful future. Diagram 2. Problem. Black to play and kill. If you miss the first move, you miss the answer. Diagram 3 problem. Black to play and kill. There are any number of corner positions that look like this one, but are not quite the same. So be aware of just memorizing patterns. Black has vital points at A, B, and C to aim at, but will any of them work? Answer to problem 1. Diagram 4. Wrong. Black bangs down his first stone on what he thinks is the vital point. But he should have looked harder. White lives with 2 and 4. Diagram 5. Right. Black honeys at 1 to narrow his opponent's eye space and plays 3 after white defends at 2. This is more like it. White is now completely dead. Diagram 6. When black has a formation like the one shown and white invades at 1, black 10 is the killing move. Black may be tempted to shift it one point to the left in Givatari, but then white cannot be killed unconditionally. Answer to problem 2. Diagram 7. Wrong. Players who have reached a certain level tend to fire at random at what looks like vital points. A move like black 1 is called a life-giving move. White's reply at 2 illustrates the correctness of widening's one one's own eye space. Diagram 8. Right. The Hane at 1 is the only move. It is a fatal blow. White cannot live. Diagram 9. White has invaded the corner, and Black has answered with 2 to 12. If White now plays elsewhere, then Black C, White A, produces the problem. Black may be tempted to make the contact play at A, but after Black A, white B, black C, white D, white is alive. Answer to problem 3. Diagram 10. Wrong. Black 1 is another random shot at a vital point, and another failure. With maddening calmness, white widens his eye space at 2. With mad- uh, the result up to black 7 is a seki, and that is equal to life. Diagram 11. Wrong. This black one is yet another failure. 
Black keeps on aiming for the vital points, but White squeezes him with 2 to 10 and lives. Diagram 12. Right. The honey at Black 1 is correct. If White plays 2, Black 3 and White 4 give him the bulky 5 shape, and then Black strikes at the vital point. The preceding three problems belong in the elementary class, so it is a bit irritating to see them missed in actual play. That shows only one thing, an ignorance of the fundamentals of life and death. Fundamentals of life and death. Life. Number one, get more room. Widen your eye space. Number two, occupy a central eye making point, a vital point. Death. Number one, reduce the enemy's room. Narrow his eye space. And number two, occupy a central eye making point, a vital point. The saying that there is death in the Hane means that the first fundamental rule for killing enemy groups is to narrow their eye space. Learn this as the fundamental rule. Then turn back to page 119 and look at the problems again. If you have no idea where to start in on them before, you have a clue now to help you. If you are looking for a general approach to life and death problems, try the following. First, check the fundamental rule. If it works, you need look no further. If it does not, then try something else. But the fundamental rule should come first. The cases where the fundamental rule works without any alteration may be in the minority, but is where you should start nonetheless. Now that we have the fundamentals, let's look at some more life and death problems. Some of them can be solved in the fundamental way, and some cannot. Try to foresee enemy counter moves. The level is elementary to intermediate. Elementary problems. Problem one, black to kill. Hint, put all your effort into the first move. Problem two, black to kill. Hint, don't let it become a co. <laughs> Problem three, black to kill. Hint, no hint. <laughs> Problem four, black to live. Hint, no hint. <laughs> The next four problems may seem somewhat harder, but the number of variations is highly restricted, so even elementary readers should not give up. Intermediate problems. Problem 5. Black to live. Hint. You can give up one or two stones, as long as you don't lose everything. Problem 6. Black to live. Hint. This is not so hard, but be careful of shortage of liberties. Problem 7. Black to kill. Hint. Pay attention to the order of moves. Carelessness invites an unexpected co. Problem 8. Black to kill. Hint. Again, the order is important, and carelessness will probably lead to a co. Wrong answers. 1. White 2 is a good reply to black 1. White keeps retreating, but in the end he lives. Black 1 and A would also be wrong. White 2, black 4, white 6. Black 1 and white 2 are forced. Black 3 is the mistake. White gets co with 4. If, back, if black plays 5 on the corner point to capture white 4, white 5 gives another co. 3. Black complacently expects white to connect to the left of 1, after which black 2 would give him the dead uh, bulky 5 shape, but as you can see, white just lives with 2. 4. Black 1 is a failure. White sneaks out with 2, etc, and links up, leaving black with no eyes at all. If black plays 1 at 2 however, white A kills him. Bye. White answers black 1 by connecting for safety at 2, then making the placement at 4. I suppose the reader understands why the cut at 8 prevents black from making his second eye. 6. At first it looks as if black can live by blocking at 1, but white doggedly presses his attack and catches black short of liberties with the throw in at 6. 7. Black 1 fails. Black probably read out the sequence, white 2, black 3, white A, black B, white is dead, but white plays 4 and has a 2 step co. 8. Black 1 is a tesuji, but that does not automatically make it correct. White 2 means co. Right answers. 
one. Black one to five. Uh, make a bent four in the corner. This is not a Seki. White is unconditionally dead. If he plays four at five, black has a throw in at four. Two. Black three is a deadly calm move. White proceeds, proceeds to capture the three black stones, but dies anyway. Three. Black one kills white from the outside. If white plays two, black three leaves him only four, and then black can make the bulky five shape with five. Number four. Black one may lack subtlety, but it is the only move. Now white has no choice but to answer three at four, and black lives with five and seven. Five. Black withdraws at one, then lives with either two or three. Six. Black widens his eye space to the fullest extent with one and three. White two and four create a seki, but that is fine with black, since for him, seki equals life. Seven. Black strikes from within, reversing the fundamental rule, because he has read out that he can kill white with three to seven. If he carelessly plays 5 at 7, however, white lives with A. Carelessness is a taboo anywhere. 8. Black 1, 3, and 5 are a carefully planned operation. After white 8 captures 2 stones, black recaptures by playing 1 point below 8 and white is dead. Diagram 1. This is the opening of an even game. White 1 and 3 are feasible, a slow and steady way of playing. Black applies solid pressure from the outside at 4, intending to occupy the ideal point at 5 if white re responds at A. If black played 4 immediately at 5, white 4 would leave him too low on the right side. White, however, upsets black's strategy by occupying 5 himself. Does the blood rush to black's head at being thwarted? I think I've seen a traffic safety poster that says, Temper causes accidents. Driving a car and playing Go are both human activities, so what applies to one applies to the other. How should black attack white one and three? Let's think about his next move. Don't think that because I'm bringing up an unrelated opening question in the chapter on life and death, I am letting my mind wander. The problem is quite relevant. Have more faith in me. A professional Go player is not likely to be so scatterbrained. <laughs> now. How should black tackle these those two white stones on the upper side? Diagram 2 Confident players at the Shodan or Tudon level would mostly play at black at 1. Mostly play black 1. A sort of disemboweling attack. At times this is an indeed... Oh, I'm gonna restart that. Woofs. Woof. <laughs> I think if you come back in two years you'll believe me. Are you memeing me? Are you saying I need two more years of study before I can see some shape? Or just in general, seeing like a break from it? I mean, either way, I'm not really offended because like that means you think I'll get stronger in two years, which is good. I'll take it. Ah, uh, okay. I need 10 years more study. <laughs> uh, it depends on what you want in this game, really. I want to reach six ton, but I'm just reminiscing on having the same opinions of Sumego two years ago myself. Sumego. Uh, so not to put words in your mouth, but I'm not extrapolating those problems to all Sumego. I think Sumego and Shape are very much to do with one another. I just think that those two particular problems are just brute force reading. Like you know the the problem that, uh, you know strong players like professionals have trouble reading but like ddks can get easily like that quintessential problem brute force reading right but that's what i like the depth of the knowledge pool is infinite yeah yeah especially with the advent of ai tell me about it <laughs> so the easy thing to do when you hate Samego is to just make really solid groups and never have to worry about it which is not really the most responsible advice but for example my no I, I don't know that's that's probably an ir irresponsible you might be playing slow moves or whatever but i'm just saying if you hate samego avoid samego be strong 
and and also I uh clearly uh am practicing what I don't I'm not practicing what I preach here. But actually first line Atari is a common shape. Maybe slightly less common than six, but I don't care I, since I've been stuck on the same ish level of Domingo for years, I've seen many patterns now. So. <laughs> ah. Or you can do stupid amounts of Tomego for practice. Nah, I think there's. I think it depends on the person. I don't think if I do stupid amount of Tomego, it'll help me. I think I've gone through periods of doing about like. No, I can't. I can't say I've done stupid amounts of Tomego because there's always people out there doing stupider amounts of Tomego, right? Like a hundred problems a day or something. That's a stupid amount of Tomego. Um, or it depends on how you're doing them, of course. Sorry. And I guess stupid amount of Tomego is inherently oxymoronic because Tomego isn't stupid. But, you know. Um, anyway. <laughs> Make strong groups is good advice. Yeah, no, yeah, forehead, of course. But then, even if you are accustomed to making strong groups, eventually someone at Fox will just, like, force you to do some Mega. Um, okay, 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 okay. Back at it. Diagram 2. Confident players at the Shodan or Tudon level would mostly play Black 1 a sort of disemboweling attack. At times, this is indeed effective, so I do not want to reject it out of hand. But what about the present circumstances? Next comes white A, black B, white C, and white is in very little danger. This is not an adequate attack. It would be better to encircle white's two-space extension inside a ring of black stones. That would give black powerful outside outward influence. Isn't the basic purpose up in the game of Go to surround things? One of the Japanese characters used to write the name of the game even means surround. If black can surround white successfully and gain outward influence, that is enough. If at the same time he can contrive to inject some uncertainty into, whether, into the question of whether white is alive or dead or what, then he will be ecstatic. Diagram 3 Black strategy is to surround white gently with one. White will naturally try to break through the encirclement with two, but there is a gaping flaw in this move, and black three strikes it. White is in a pinch. If you place four, black five cuts off white two and leaves white's main group encircled. White certainly cannot allow this. Diagram four. But. If white makes his escape with four, the damage done by black five is unbearable. This is the perfect example of black gaining profit while attacking. Diagram five. Should white hold himself to two then? Black can wall him in smartly with three. Black three at A would be a concession. The contact play at three is ideal. Diagram six. Ideal or not, can't white break past black 3 in the last diagram with 1 to 5 here? Yes. But then black plays 6. If he was happy with diagram 4, I don't see how he can complain about this result. But what is wrong with stopping white more gently at A in diagram 5? In a word, black A would be an amateurish move. A good severe move like black 3, if it exists, is always best. Black 3 is an emphatic professional move. Diagram 7. If white attaches himself directly to black 1 with 2, black should shut him in with 3 and 5. White may have no trouble living, but it is not hard to imagine the outer wall he lets black make becoming strong enough to dominate the entire game, creating no end of problems for white. This type of maneuver is important between the opening and the middle game. I do not claim that the knight's move enclosure at black 1, shown in diagrams 3 to 7, is always good. I simply mean it is one example to explain the philosophy of enclosing. There may be a better move, or there may not. What counts is black's attitude in playing 1. But I'm not saying he has to play this way. His skill or otherwise in executing the maneuver is another factor. I guess the best move is the one that fits his strength and expresses his philosophy best. Diagram 8. If black really understands what he is doing, a move like this may be good. If he does not really understand, that will come out in the continuation. What he must avoid is blind imitation. 
playing one because he remembers having seen some professional play it. Monkey see, monkey do. White will come through the gap at two, and black will not know what to do next. Diagram 9. I would like to continue a little from Diagram 5. White, 1, 3, and 5, and the like, although not very high class moves, are good from the standpoint of widening white's eye space. This is the type of move to make when you have to live. If you want something a little more advanced, try playing 3 at 4, for example, and, white and widening white's formation to the limit. If black blocks 6 with, uh, with 6 to the right of 5, white will still be alive, so he should leave this part of the board as it is and use Sente to take the initiative elsewhere. This is important. One often sees black answering white so dutifully that white lives in Sente. Diagram 10. If white leaves his precarious group to play elsewhere and the expectation that black will answer, black has a chance to kill him. The basic way of killing is to narrow the enemy's eye space, so black plays 1 and 3. Even, the invent, even in the event of his failing to kill white, if he plays like this, he cannot do himself any harm. Is my point clear? Diagram 11. This is an example of bad play by black that sometimes appears in 6 to 9 stone handicap games. Black 6 to 22, trying to uh, seize the territory on the right side and get settled quickly, are a despicable way to counter white's common opening at 1, 3, and 5. Look at the expression on black's face. How relieved he is to have seen the sequence up to black 22 go exactly as he was hoping it would. Little does he realize how fundamentally wrong this way of playing is. Essentially, he has helped surround his own groups. The more handicapped stones he places, the more he should be able to do well in the opening and not have to let himself be surrounded like this. The side that surrounds the other, as white does through 23, always gains outward influence and has the better position. Next, white's power will make itself known in all directions. To begin with, he can give black a hard time by invading at A and B. If black loses the game, it will only stand to reason. Refer back to diagram 24 on page 51. As far as making life goes, black's play is correct, but he should only live like this when he is already completely surrounded by white. Diagram 12. This is an example of good play. Black has various other good moves besides one, but whichever of them he picks, the important part is not perfection in executing the maneuver, but whether or not he has a firm grasp of the thinking that underlines it. Experts can finesse their way out, bunglers can bungle their way out, but everyone should break out somehow through white's encirclement. Let that never be forgotten. Black 1 to white 12 form the first part of the sequence. If black uses 9 to go to the aid of 5, the fight can become so confused that it will be hard to tell where the focus lies. First, black should get his main force out into the open. Black 13 and so on are given to show how strongly black can continue. Faced with such a heavy attack, white has no opportunity to hand out surprises. Black has completely taken over the initiative. There is nothing difficult in playing like this. If black can keep on in this spirit, he can reverse the tables on white. Usually it is black who is chased around and forced to heed where he puts each stone, always on the defensive. Break through the enemy's encirclement and get your head out into the fresh air and you will not have to deal, uh, not have to contend with troublesome questions of life and death. The preceding two diagrams are as different as day and night. I hope you understand why. No matter how determined you are to not let yourself be surrounded, however, when you have a stronger opponent, you may be forced or fooled into letting them fence in one of your large groups. For a player who is weak with, at life and death, nothing else holds such great terror. In view of that, life and death are important to study after all. If white manages to build a position like the ones in diagrams 13 and 14, and you refuse to enter it, you then have to concede it as territory to him. If black, one plays, if black plays 1 on the theory that even if he dies he has nothing to lose, then he cannot avoid being surrounded by white. 
Situations like these arise, so you cannot just decide to never let yourself be surrounded and ignore the study of life and death. If black can live after one in these diagrams, he gains a large profit inside white's tail. So there you have it. Uh, hopefully this chapter uh, was useful to you. I know it taught me a few things. Whether or not I can apply all of them is uh, a test for time, I suppose. But at any rate, uh, let's look forward to next week's covering of chapter seven, how to study Joseki. Uh, see you later, YouTube.